name's Andrew Steen. I'm not a, at all an expert in this field. I'm interested uh, sort of coming in. Therefore, I'll ask a simple question, but I certainly hope that there will be other more, uh, you know, uh, developed questions from other people. So my thought was that um, when I first uh, I saw self-sampling assumption, I thought, yes, that sounds very reasonable. I was sort of feeling, yeah, I see why one might, one might say that. And then you pointed out difficulties with it. Then you came to the self-indication self assumption, Again, it looks very reasonable. You think, yes, you can see why we might say that. But then you showed why that second assumption seems to sort of go against some of the things that emerged from this, the first one. And then you said the bit I, where you lost me. You said that that was all very neat and tidy. And, I, and it didn't leave me that feeling. It was more to me that both assumptions were saying, leading to different conclusions. So it wasn't that therefore they cancelled one another out. It seemed that both are therefore really problematic. So have um, I misunderstood something? Yeah, well, so what the self-indication assumption does is in these problematic cases where you have two hypotheses with different numbers of observers but you find yourself in the special group that would exist according to either hypothesis, like the doomsday argument or Adam and Eve, that there the self-indication assumption cancels out this sort of counterintuitive shift towards uh, thinking that the smaller number of observers' hypothesis must be true. Um, now, it doesn't cancel out all the consequences of the self-sampling self assumption. So, in the cosmological cases, um, if you remember the, uh, this one, for example. So, here we are not considering theories that postulate different numbers of observers. We have um, a theory that holds the number of observers constant. Uh, you might consider a rival theory here, which would have the same total number of observers, but distributed differently between type A, type B, and type C universes. Uh, and there, the combination of self-sampling assumption and the self-indication assumption would still enable you to drive observational predictions from this. So you still get some degree of bridging um, from descriptions about the objective facts about the world and your indexical information that you happen to be a particular kind of observer. Okay, thanks. I'm going to carry on listening. So okay. uh, I, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, I share, so I have sympathies with the last question. It does seem that the right conclusion to draw is that perhaps we're going wrong at an earlier point uh, than uh, arriving at either of these hypotheses. And perhaps the earlier point involves the whole notion that the right way to think about our epistemic situation is in terms of, well, I think you put it in these terms at some point, uh, one, one is going to be um, uh, incarnated, no, not incarnated, one is going to be um, uh, created as one of this group of observers. One is, um, as it were, behind a veil of ignorance in the Rawlsian sense. Um, is, is that... Can, can one really motivate either of these assumptions without a metaphor of that form? Um, well, it's certainly not the case that one is meant to interpret the uh, randomness literally, as if it required like a time-traveling stork that went around according to some me stochastic mechanism and scattered these. So, at least in my formulation, all it's meant to do is to uh, give a prescription for what your prior probability function should look like. Um, now, one way to do that is by imagining this situation where we are as yet not familiar with some kind of indexical fact, say, and we have to assign credence somehow. Um, now, if we happen already to be familiar with the relevant facts, then it's like the normal problem of old evidence for Bayesianism, that it seems that you can still learn things from old evidence, um, but there is, I guess, uh, less opportunity to point, pinpoint somebody down because they have to sort of honestly tell you what they would have thought or what they think a certain subset of the facts that they now imply. Um, but it's harder to run bets and stuff like that. Um, but it is, um, it is possible. I mean, I share your... It, at this point, it might be that there is something more primary that, that needs to change if I want to resolve the conflict between you know, these different horns of the dilemma that we seem to either have this kind of doomsday argument-like shift or this presumptuous philosopher shift. Um, well, well, look, perhaps I can... Let me pose my question more in terms of a proposal, an alternative proposal. Um, it might be thought that 
what we're interested in cosmology um, is evidence. And the fact that we exist as conscious observers um, doesn't actually add anything to the evidence that we're ordinarily interested in anyway, over and above the fact, for example, that there are lots of stars. It might seem that given that there are lots of stars, then you have all of the conditions in place for complex beings. And what follows in a universe with lots of stars, whether there end up being lots of observers in it or not, depends on contingencies that really aren't very interesting from the point of view of, of cosmology. It would seem that one has already got the relevant evidence, in fact, <coughs> at the level of the existence of stars. Well, I guess if you construe your evidence such that it gives you immediate justified confidence about the whole structure of the universe, that if, if, if it was part of our evidence that there is a lot of stars everywhere, then you would already know maybe enough about objective reality that your indexical information wouldn't be required. But I think a more plausible construal of the evidence that we actually have is that we know some local fact about the world. We've made a certain observation, we've seen an instrument reading, maybe, maybe we have direct observational access to, to things in our, that we can see directly, say, with our telescopes, but certainly not beyond that. And so then, if you have a very, very large uh, universe or multiverse, there might be different parts of this multiverse, different separate universes, where some there are a lot of stars in, some there are a few stars in. And if you want to have um, some way to connect the evidence that you actually have about, it looks like there are many stars around here, to hypotheses about this overall structure, then you still need some kind of bridging principle, it seems. Um. John Barrow, um, I, I always like to use these sampling principles in complete the opposite direction, that you, know, you shouldn't be looking at them as a way of getting more evidence, as Simon had hoped, and, uh, but as a way of avoiding drawing the wrong conclusions from the evidence that you have. So if you ignore anthropic self-selection, you will draw the wrong conclusions from the evidence that you have, and the prime example which motivated Brandon Carter was um, Dirac's large number coincidences, because Dirac didn't appreciate that uh, the coincidences between the 10 to the 40 and the 10 to the 80, a number of particles in our horizon, uh, compared with the ratio of the strong to electromagnetic forces because he didn't appreciate that that coincidence was a consequence of the time when we exist in the universe, the main sequence lifetime, he drew a radical and presumably incorrect and unjustified conclusion that the gravitation constant was falling with time. So because he didn't appreciate that our observation of that coincidence had been biased by the time when we observe, he drew a completely wrong conclusion from it. So. Likewise, if you're a string theorist and you're working out the probability that some constant of nature is going to fall out with a particular value, if you decide that the most probable value that it's predicted to have is the one that we should see in the universe and you know nothing about anthropic uh, selection and you find that the universe doesn't have that most probable value, you would wrongly rule out your string theory as being at variance with observation. Whereas with anthropic insight, you might see that it wouldn't be possible for the universe to display that most probable value because there wouldn't be any observers. So I think it, uh, this emphasis that, that taking into account anthropic selection stops you drawing wrong conclusions from the evidence is more in line with the way we think about selection effects in experimental physics. So taking into account experimental uh, you know, bias is not some new theory of the universe. Some people ridiculously thought that anthropic principle was some sort of new cosmological theory. You know, and it doesn't tell you anything new about the universe. It is nuts. All it does is to stop you drawing the wrong conclusions from the evidence. Just as if you know about selection effects in an experiment uh, in the lab, uh, you will not draw the wrong conclusions from the results. So I think that's certainly a part of what you hope um, that the self-sampling assumption or your anthropic reasoning should do to prevent you from drawing wrong conclusions from the evidence you have. I think though that that fades 
that, that, that there is no crisp distinction between not drawing the wrong conclusion and drawing the right conclusion. I think that these, um, it's a matter of looking at all the evidence you have and then seeing what it actually implies or does not imply probabilistically. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like in a case like this, what your view would be. Um, so clearly deriving the conclusion that we should expect to see a type A universe would be a wrong conclusion. Um, but how about uh, whether we should expect to see a type B universe or a type C universe? Well, in the other, what did you call it, SIA, you had those, those um, words, other, th other things being equal. And I think in this game that means anything could be true. Um, so what type of further you know, so fact? It's just so think? difficult to know what the other things are and what you mean by them being equal. Okay, you know, so if in type B universes, okay, there may be a million observers, but you know, how many sites could there have been where there are observers? Uh, Universes have intrinsic time scale. You know, these problems are not purely probabilistic because there are in intrinsic time scales in, in the problems. Um, I remember so Gott, Gott, the, Gott, the Gott went, uh, Rich Gott went sort of rather horribly, I think, off the rails with, you know, it was a series of examples where he used um, confidence intervals, you know, to say, you know, what's the 95% confidence interval? You know, we've been here for so long what's the 95% confidence interval that we will be here at some time in the future? And, you know, if we divide the time we've been here by 39, okay, you know, we can work out what's the least and what's the most likely time we'll still be around. But, you know, I can absolutely guarantee that none of us in this room will be uh, around in 100 years' time uh, here in Oxford. Um, because there's an intrinsic time scale. Yeah, yeah. In the well, so, so there are several things there. Um, so as we go to this one first, I think uh, the, the case, I guess, easiest to imagine is if um, the type B and type C universes are indistinguishable, except for some experiment that hasn't yet been carried out. So some little microscopic detail that we could find out. But otherwise, the observers are the same kinds of observers in each case. Um, so for all we know, we might be either of these. Like, um, and we might then form some prediction. F w we might consider what, what this type of theory would predict. And, and I think that um, if there were other relevant differences, then, then clearly they would have to be taken into account as well. And indeed, uh, the Richard Gott, Richard Gott III, he had his delta T argument, which is a kind of version of the doomsday argument, mm -hmm. independently discovered. Um, in my view, an inferior version for precisely this reason that he ignores the prior uh, empirical information that we clearly must take into account when trying to predict when the human species will come to an end or indeed when a particular person will come to an end or any process will come to an end. So even if this self-sampling assumption stuff works, there is also this empirical information. If we have observed many processes of a similar kind, that, that will clearly tend to bias our expectations. Um, it's interesting, in, if one just takes a step back in this field, how many things have been independently discovered several times um, in different versions. So the doomsday argument, um, at least twice, uh, I, um, I think the Carter-Leslie version is, is better because it does, in a Bayesian way, kind of use all the information. Uh, the self-indication assumption. Um, there, there used to be a time when, when like every six months or something some new philosophy paper would be published or a cosmology paper where somebody uh, declared that they had sort of resolved this problem or defeated the doomsday argument and it would always be because they had like rediscovered the self-indication assumption but under a different name, maybe less clearly formulated so they couldn't easily see that it amounted to the same thing. Um, and then also in in ignorance of, of, of the fact that there are these challenges for it like the presumptuous philosopher which it seems you should at least have something to say about if that's the solution you want to go with. And, and I think that um, versions of the doomsday argument have also been kind of discovered a number of different times. Um, this seems to be a problem with academia in general, at least in some fields, that it, it, there is no clear aggregation. It's, it's sometimes hard to know what has already been discovered and there seems to be a lot of unnecessary duplication. Um, maybe the, if, if, if we could solve that sort of information organizing problem we would be advancing much further, particularly when it's an interdisciplinary field where you might have 
So, so the philosophers that can't read, sort of, maybe the, uh, some of them can, but not all can read cosmology papers with formulas and stuff. And the cosmologists don't want to wade through 20 sort of crappy philosophy papers before they make their contribution. And so, so it's much more convenient just to talk to your own uh, group of people, but then that, that uh, thwarts these opportunities for collaboration. There seemed to be some confusion. Did you say at the beginning that you, you thought that Carter hadn't published the Doomsday Argument? Uh, that's what I believed. Uh, that, that he first uh, told Leslie, and he was yes, the first. That's not, that's not Leslie. Sort of, I think said said this, and then Valenkin's book and Gott's book sort of claimed it was unpublished. In fact, Carter wrote a long, detailed article about it, which is in Phil Trans A, Volume 310. So it was the conference on constants of nature in London, 1983, and then all the papers were written up as a volume of Phil Trans Roysock and then published as a book. Um, but that's where he introduced it in that talk. And it's written up in considerable detail, um, you know, in, in an article that's, you know, 25 pages long. Yeah, so that might be right. I mean, all I know is that Leslie claims he heard it from Carter without Carter having published it, but that, that might be correct. We better draw it to an end then. Thank our speaker. Thank you.